Welcome to the first talk of the afternoon session. It's my pleasure to present to you Dr. Brian O'Brien, Associate Professor of, Chemis of Chemistry and Chair of the Chemistry Department, who will introduce uh, our speaker, Harold Proto. Larry. Um, our next speaker, Professor Harold Croteau, is Royal Society Research Professor in the School of Chemistry and Molecular Sciences at the University of Sussex in England. Uh, Professor Croteau received his PhD in 1964 at the University of Sheffield uh, doing the spectroscopy of free radicals with uh, Professor R.N. Dixon as his PhD research advisor. He then did postdoctoral work both at the National Research Council in Ottawa, Canada, and at Bell Laboratories. In 1967, he began as a professor at the University of Sussex, attaining the rank of full professor in 1985 and Royal Society professor in 1991. Dr. Croteau is also the recipient of numerous honors and awards, among them membership in Academia Europea, the Hewlett-Packard Europhysics Prize, the Longstaff Medal of the Royal Society of Chemistry, the International Prize for New Materials from the American Physical Society, and the Italgas Prize for Innovation in Chemistry. He's also a uh, frequent commentator um, in uh, areas of popular science and also an author of many articles in popular science publications. Professor Croteau's chemical training and experiences are uniquely varied, yet complementary, often in ways which have led to important and singularly interesting chemical discoveries. His early studies in the spectroscopy of small molecules produced many fundamental discoveries, among them the preparation and characterization of the first compound containing a phosphorus carbon double bond. This is a structural type which had been thought by many theoreticians of the time to be incapable of existence. As Professor Gray pointed out during that time, you could ask a theoretician and find out all the wrong answers to your questions. Um, this discovery and Dr. Croteau's further efforts in the general area of carbon-phosphorus multiple bond chemistry form a major part of the basis of what has grown into a highly active and completely new area of modern inorganic chemical research. Um, Harry's interest in small molecule spectroscopy led him not only into the laboratory, but also into outer space. In the depths of space exist, we now know, many bizarre molecules. We know of many of them through Harry's research in the area of radio astronomy, a subset of the field known as cosmochemistry. Many of these discoveries were of molecules containing high percentages of carbon. The high carbon deep space molecules in which Harry had developed an interest led him back to Earth, where he began studies of the composition of carbon vapor. These recent studies led to what is certainly one of the most startling discoveries of the 20th century in any field of science, perhaps one of the most startling scientific discoveries of all time. This discovery has given rise to an entire field of chemistry and material science which would have been viewed by many as an impossibility just a few years ago. Dr. Croteau will tell you the story of that discovery and of its consequences. It is my privilege and honor to present to you Professor Harold Croteau. My, that was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Um, well, it's uh, an honor to come here, and uh, it's not an honor to follow the last speaker, I tell you. They say uh, that was a wonderful talk, and the Marines have been. I've just come from Boston. I'm going to say the British are coming. Okay. Um, may I also say that I, too, have been, and my wife are here, and have been treated like kings, perhaps not quite like, I suppose, Gustav, King Gustavus Adolphus, but wonderfully, two students, Ryan and Matt, and of course Brian, um, who, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do when I have to carry my own bags to the airport. Uh, 
um, it's going to be very difficult. It's in, indeed an honor to come here, and um, it's an honor to, to speak in, in the presence of such wonderful speakers. Harry Gray talk, told you today, I think, some of the most important things I've heard a speaker uh, tell you, of that we chemists are not just polluting the environment, but we're really trying hard to solve the problems. They have really hard problems, and he's right that somewhere out there in this audience, there are going to be people stimulated by him to solve the problems to save us because we've got some big ones coming. Chemists are not all bad. Not as bad as physicists, but we're, we're fairly reasonable. Um, let me uh, just start with the first uh, slide. Uh, with a bit of luck, it will come up, and I'll switch this fellow off as I'm going to talk about that. I, I hope you can see that. Can you see this guy in the back? Yes. Well, if you didn't say anything, I know you, you saw him anyway. It's actually uh, Brunofsky playing with his grandchild. And I'd like to now do an experiment. I want you to put your hand up. Anyone who played with a toy like this when you were a child? Okay, it's a very large percentage. Now, let me tell you, if, you, if you're a, a, a parent, how many of you gave it to your children? See what those subversive parents are up to, okay? Um, because I know what they were trying to do. They gave it to you, if you're a child, and if you put the sort of cube through the square hole and the triangle through the triangle hole, that made them really happy and they went off and you did that. But actually, when, when you, their back was turned, you'd, I know that some of you, would, it doesn't matter which one, you'd look for the round hole and you'd try to force it through the round hole. And when they come in and discover this, they get worried because they realize they better take you to see a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist says, look, don't worry, he said. Anyone who tries to force it through the round hole all the time is just perfect to be a theoretical physicist, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, let, let me just say, uh, that's an in-joke, obviously. Um, let, let me just say that it's a wonderful toy, and I think it's one of the most important experiments any child could ever do. And that's because they're learning something about shapes. And it's not an accident that we sort of like this molecule. And I feel really privileged and honored amongst all, a lot of chemists that we co-discovered this molecule. You know, it, that it picked us out uh, it really is something to be very proud of because I mean, I've just been through Brian's lab, and he's got these wonderful plants, and he's doing some beautiful science and stuff that I really like doing. And I've got stuck with this molecule, which is not all good, and it's not all bad either. Now, the, the interesting aspect of this toy is that we know that the brain is actually stimulated by certain shapes, horizontal lines and vertical lines and round shapes. And, and so it's deep in our brain and the things that stimulate us is this joy of structure and symmetry. And we know that everything takes place in the brain, all our, the things that we love and things that we hate. And so it's interesting to, uh, to think about that. And that symmetry is fundamental to many aspects of the world. Now, it's not only in this, but it's also um, in Neolithic structures like these that were form, found in Scotland, uh, that you see that primitive man was really enjoyed these, making these things. And these are the platonic structures, the five of them. So, it, you know, you don't have to be an intellectual. By the way, intellectual is not a great thing. A friend of mine, he's written a book, and in there you'll find the definition of an intellectual is a, a, um, an intellectual is a parasite who exudes culture. So if anybody calls you a, 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 an intellectual, beware. They may not be complimenting you. But anyway, uh, these guys really appreciated some of the wonders that we appreciate. Now, we know the Greeks also were stimulated by crystals, and perhaps many of you who were scientists, many of the kids who were taking chemistry and physics, were stimulated by having crystallized materials. And these beautiful structures told the Greeks something that perhaps deep down in chemistry, uh, structure and symmetry was important. And they developed a periodic table which had originally four elements the four platonic structures. And uh, then a fifth one was discovered, uh, one on the right, the dodecahedron, and uh, over here. And uh, in fact, I, I have a feeling that uh, you know, the British government puts so little money into chemistry nowadays that I think they still think there's only five elements in the periodic table. Uh, I'm hoping that over here you know differently, but I'm worried by this month's Scientific American that even here, 
there is going to be problems in funding fundamental science. However, nevertheless, there'll be some people who in the garages and the backyards will do the, do the work anyway, because they are unstoppable, the real scientists. Now, there's a nice story there, and there was a, there was some, this is going to be a story about the discovery of C60, which will involve many people, many football teams, and particularly students. And one of them, Sean O'Brien, sent me a letter. He said, Dear Harry, did you ever hear the story of the discovery of the dodecahedron? He said, in 470 BC, Hippasus found it. He was very boastful of his discovery, so much so that his colleagues drowned him. Sean goes on to say, there is a lesson here for everyone, OK? <laughs> He's an Irishman, right? So uh, <laughs> from Chicago, all right. So uh, I think his, his grandmother must be Italian. Now, um, let me go on, because there are not only these wonderful shapes. Oh, I would like to say that although this picture of the elements at first sight might seem rather naive. In actual fact, I think it's very deep. Because the Greeks actually appreciated that deep down, symmetry was important. And now we know the nucleus has these symmetries, somewhat more complex, somewhat less complex. But basically, those were right. And therefore, their real feeling for nature was perfect and spot on. And that was an important aspect. Now, apart from those symmetries, there are wonderful symmetries in space, and one of my favorites is beautiful spiral galaxy. We can consider our own Milky Way galaxy to be rather similar, and if we consider the sun and the stars around us or out here in the doghouse, as we look across the galactic plane, we see massive clouds of gas, such as this one here, where the hot stars are heating the gas to incandescence. And by spectroscopy, we can say that this is mainly hydrogen. We can tell what else is there. Not only structures like this, but there are wonderful stars, very important stars. This star has blown off its outer shell. This shell is perhaps a light year across. What's a light year? It's 10,000 times uh, Pluto's orbit. That's a big object. That gas from this central object has been blown off into space. And that, that material goes on to form new stars and planets. All the element, all the carbon in your body, apart from the hydrogen, was synthesized in a star like this. Unfortunately, this star wasn't very keen on your particular carbon atoms, and it spewed you out. Otherwise, you'd still be in there. And there are some people I can think of who should still be in there. Okay. <laughs> uh, they're causing a lot of problems at the moment. OK. Uh, well, these stars, as I say, are really important in the story. I'll come back to them. There are also some very important objects, such as these. These are the black clouds that st uh, streak across the sky, and the Greeks used to look at these and see them. And they thought that these were holes in the celestial sphere. They thought that, well, the celestial sphere, as you well know, is a, is a glass dish here with diamonds stuck in it. And it's all held up by turtles and, and uh, ultimately Arnold Schwarzenegger's underneath this thing, holding this thing up. And uh, every, I don't know whether you have the same sort of um, uh, rivalry as we have, but uh, the picture that they had was that um, a, uh, a, a sort of Scottish football team uh, supporter had heaved a brick through this thing and broken a hole in it, and so you could see out into space. So that was the image, that there was a hole through this dish, and those black areas were places where you could see out into space. We now know that that was not correct. It turned out it was an English football supporter that actually threw the brick. Um, but in fact, it, what happened was in the 60s, Charles Towns, who was this incredible scientist who in, basically developed the maser and, and invented the maser and the laser, turned his mind, his brilliant mind, to uh, space. And he it was who really pushed to try and find out what was in these clouds. And we discovered they're full of molecules. And uh, there's enough uh, alcohol in, in, say, the Orion area of the Orion to make something like 10 to the 28 gallons of Jim Beam. You know, OK? Now, I, that's not the best whiskey, I tell you. I much prefer sort of scotch, but uh, then my whole rest of my family are all scots, so I would have to say that, wouldn't I? OK. Now, it turns out that these are fascinating areas. If you talk about the chemistry we're doing, we're doing no chemistry at all compared to the, the chemistry in these clouds. There's fantastic amounts of chemistry going on in these clouds, and they're fascinating areas. Well, it turned out that I was interested in this, and uh, what happened was that um, about uh, the early 70s, 
I got interested in radio astronomy. And here we see a radio telescope. Um, it's in Algonquin Park in Canada, and it's the one that the, the, NR the NRC was running. And just to give you an idea, this here is the prime focus, and there's an amplifier, a receiver. Now, a radio telescope is just a radio. It's got a slightly larger dish on it. This one's 40, 46 meters, and very, very sensitive amplifiers. And here, this door, you can actually walk through it. And in fact, there's a little winch here to winch up apparatus. And uh, if, you're, if your uh, observations aren't going very well and you're getting a bit unhappy about it, you can always hang yourself from the end of here. And uh, uh, Anyway, this dish was um, one that I, I was familiar with because I'd been a postdoc at NRC. And about the early 70s, um, David Walton, my close friend and colleague, who was the world's expert at stringing carbon chains together, we got together with an undergraduate. And I'm, one of the great places here is that you have undergraduates doing research. This is perhaps, these are the best people in the world because first of all, A, some of them believe you, all right, as a research. <laughs> and then 50%, but the other 50% don't believe you, okay? And both the things are good, all right, as we shall see. Now, Dave Walton, can string these long carbon chains as he's done here, and he made a chain of 32 carbon atoms. And I got interested in what would happen if I gave the Gustavus Adolphus cheerleader at the beginning of the football game a very bendy cane, I would think, to throw up in the air, right? Now, that would solve inter interesting problems of uh, quantum mechanical problems, fundamental problems. And it all started, for me, with this. What happens when a molecule which is so long, as it rotates and bends, and Dave could make these molecules, and we had this wonderful undergraduate, uh, Alexander, Anthony Alexander, to make it. We can no longer do that because in England, or in Britain now, we cannot do something new with an undergraduate. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you already, so we can't do research anymore, which is a bit of an unfortunate thing. However, Alexander came, and he was a wonderful student. He synthesized these and uh, made the first of the molecules, and it's here. It was a five-carbon atom chain. I call it cyanodiacetylene. This molecule had been detected in interstellar space by radio astronomy, and the way you do that is you take a radio telescope, you point it at one of these black clouds. This molecule is rotating. Because it has a dipole moment, it gives out a radio wave, just like a radio transmitter. There's the electrons are going up in the, in, the air, in the transmitter, and you detect it. This molecule is rotating, and the negative and positive ends are changing, and so you can see the rotational of this molecule. This was detected. We just made that and worked out what it was, the frequency of its rotation. And I sent the, a letter to Takeshi Oka, a fantastic scientist at Chicago now, but then at NRC, and we were close colleagues of postdocs. And we got together, and believe it or not, we detected that molecule. This is the detection of HC5N in Sagittarius B2. And here we see a well-known molecule, it used to be called acetaldehyde. I don't know what it's called, ethinyl now. I think it's a much less interesting molecule now it's named by this thing. But anyway, here is this signal. And it was a big surprise. In these dark clouds, long carbon chain molecules were floating around. And if you can do that, maybe longer ones. And Dave Walton worked out how to make another one with seven carbon atoms. And Colin Kirby, a great student who's working on boron sulfur compounds in his spare time, synthesized this fellow. And we saw that. And finally, we worked out, Takeshi worked out how to, how to see that one. So at the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s, we had this peculiar result. That these black clouds had these long carbon molecules floating around. And why was that? Well, just about that time, some fascinating stars were being detected by the advances in infrared astronomy. Now, this is not one of them, but it's somewhat similar. I'll show you because you can see it. The central star has blown off the outer shell, and um, some stars has, have got so much garbage and dust inside them, okay, uh, that, um, you know, it's like Los Angeles, you know, it's all, all coming out of this thing. And some of it gets out into the atmosphere and out into space, and you can't see them. And it turned out that this, these were carbon stars, old carbon stars that were throwing out the carbon. And all the carbon in your body came from these carbon stars. So it seemed to me that this was an interesting area, particularly because these carbon chains were coming out. Long carbon chains were coming out of them. And that was the situation at the beginning of the 80s. And then, as luck would have it, one day in Easter 1984, 
um, I uh, went to Houston, and I've been invited there by Bob Curl. This is a picture of Houston in the middle of winter. I thought you'd like to see that picture here, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, we lived in Canada for two years, and I don't think it's much difference. We've seen wind chills of minus 40 and 52. But anyway, this was it. And a few, down the, uh, a few miles down the road from, from the center is Rice University, where Rick Smalley had developed a technique which has revolutionized one area of material science, and it's called cluster science. It's an important, really important area. And Rick had worked out how you could juggle with something like 40 aluminum atoms, let them do what they want. You've got to juggle them. Imagine, imagine this. How do you throw up 40 iron atoms and let them do what they want? This technique, I'll just show you. It's a little bit technical, but not very much. It's, this thing here is a one millimeter channel. It's about two centimeters long. And at this end, there's a solenoid valve which opens and shuts. The helium passes down to this point. And when the helium pulse gets to here, a laser fires. And it's focused on this disk. And at the time, I, it was, I think it was a silicon carbide disk or an aluminum disk here. And a plasma comes off the disk and is blown into the vacuum on the right-hand side. And uh, it's a fantastic apparatus. And, and Rick was jumping all over this. He was so proud of it. And he's a very persuasive guy. And uh, uh, it, this was actually on the inside. Rick wasn't jumping over this. This is the inside of the thing here. And here's the plasma coming out. And then it passes through this cone, which is a very sharp skimmer. And so the, you imagine a, a, a gas wind coming through here, passing through here. So a beam ends up in this. Has it got a pipe on here? OK, Gustavo is a doll. OK, it hits this crown, all right? All right. Now then, what I would now do is go to the next picture, which is a little bit technical, but don't worry. The, I hope you can see this, but let me just take you through it. The nozzle is here. The laser goes in through this hole, and the plasma comes out here and is skimmed by this cone. So the beam goes to this point. Now here are two plates which are charged. So imagine this guy coming down the end, and it arrives, arrives at this point, and then as it gets here, you hit it with the laser, and the laser ionizes this cluster. And because these are charged, it flicks them up this tube. Oh, it went too fast, OK? You go up this tube. Now then, if it's a heavy guy, it goes slowly. If it's a light guy, it goes fast. And so by time of arrival at the top, the time it takes for it to get from the bottom of here to the top, you can find out how heavy the thing is. Now, if you started with iron, and you know it's only iron atoms, you can work out whether it's 1, 2, 3, 4, or 50 iron atoms. So I looked at this, and I thought, well, this plasma coming out looks a bit like this carbon star. And when I got home that evening, and I was staying with Bob Curl, who had invited me and told me to see Rick, I told Bob, I said, look, if we, if we put graphite in here, maybe we can produce a plasma similar to the carbon st star, and maybe we can produce these carbon chain molecules. Maybe we can prove, at least in the laboratory, that this is a viable way of producing these carbon chain molecules. And there were two other uh, ideas of how it was done, but this was mine, and I was keen to show this one. And Bob Kerr was really keen, and he said he would work on Rick to try and get this experiment off the ground. Well, that was Easter 1984. Around August 1985, about 17 months later, I got a phone call from Bob and said, Look, yes, we're going to run this experiment. And um, I, I said, are you coming? I said, uh, of course I'm coming. So I, I got the first plane, which was Continental, and I got there in three days. Now, <laughs> but I got to Houston, not, not Brussels. OK. Okay, in joke, I hope, maybe not. Anyway, um, the, um, so I got there, and the first thing was I met uh, two students. And on the left is Jim Heath, now, now at UCLA, uh, starting a really fantastic career as a young scientist, and Sean O'Brien, who's at uh, Texas Instruments. And I tell you, these two guys, this guy's probably going to produce the best semiconductors in the future, and Jim is going to produce the best clusters and new materials. And you can tell why, because we're, we're drinking Budweiser, all right? <laughs> this is, we're, and eating chicken fajitas, which I really got to enjoy. Not only that, there was a wonder, another wonderful student who is now in Japan, Yuan Liu, who's uh, from China uh, and is working for Herxt in Tokyo at the moment. 
Now, these were the, the fantastic students, and it was just wonderful because I could just sit in front of the video screen and they could run this 747. And it was a very difficult apparatus. It all sounds very easy. So we started off, and almost immediately, these carbon chains turned up. It was um, unbelievable. It was just dead simple. But something else happened. And this is why fundamental science is so important. Applied science is important, and 85% of the funds go into applied science. And you've got to work out how much you're going to put into crazy people like myself who just want to follow astrophysics. And I su suggest it's more than zero. Okay? I don't know what that number is. I suggest it should be about 14 15%. And it's getting precious. Well, it's zero now in Britain. It's getting below 10% in this country. Anyway, we do this experiment. And believe it or not, on the 4th of September, almost exactly 10 years ago, Wednesday the 4th, 1985, we got this. And this is the key mass spectrum. Now, let me take you through it. On the bottom, we have the time in microseconds. That says how, that tells you that this fellow here took tw 20 here, 20 microseconds to get from the bottom of the tower to the top of the tower. This guy took about 21. And this is carbon 10. This is 10 carbon clusters stuck together. It's probably, well, this has got nine. OK, so this is nine there. Probably that's what it is. We don't know at this stage. But we see that 11 is a strong guy. 12, 13, 14, 15. 13 is a wimp. All right? These are the Marines. All right? Now, these guys we know. We've seen them since the 60s. But we still don't know what the hell those are. 11, 15, 19, 23. But in our experiment, something quite unbelievable turned up. Here we see a signal, and I wrote on my printout, C60 plus question mark, and in the top left-hand corner, repeat this helium to carbon ratio, C60 huge and C70 also. And I wasn't the only one, because the students, and this is another lesson for students, let me press the right, I got so many of these things, I, I think, okay, press the right thing. They wrote, on the same day, we find in the students, C60 and C70 are very strong, exclamation mark. That's the exclamation mark on the poster. Right? That was written by one of the students. The next day, C60 is very large on the 5th. And here's the lesson. If you're doing research, really write up really good notebooks, because you can bet your life your supervisor won't. All right? That's but it's the, I mean, I'm really not very good. I mean, I, but I have had these wonderful students who really have. And it's sometimes crucially important to know exactly what happened. Now then, what was this C60 cluster? Well, we started off, and Brian's brought this really nice model. We know from the textbooks that graphite is sheets and layers of carbon. And that's the picture you see. And here is a real lesson. This picture, a chunk of carbon like that, is almost a no-no. All right, That, it will, we now realize, is a highly unstable structure. We should have known it. In fact, if theoreticians had told us that, we would never have believed them. But they didn't tell us that, so we still didn't believe them. OK, but so that's what we have. So we're sitting there trying to find out, well, what it is. And this is where we were. We're sitting there with our, it's the same thing, right? We've got to put something, but nothing fits. How do we put this through there? Now then, with, we've got graphite. That's what we started off with. We've got the number 60. We're sitting there with our little model. Have we got the right structure? So we're looking there. Now, I was staying with Bob Curl, and I thought I'd show you the floor of his loo. Now, this is the washroom for translating on it. Now, every morning, I would sit and contemplate this floor, all right? <laughs> what was special about this thing? Well. We've got the number six. And if we had the number six, that would be wonderful. But we didn't have the number six. If we had six hexagons round here, around here, that would be C24. And it wasn't C24, it was C23. You can look, you can sit forever in Bob Curl's loo. You will never see something special about the number 60. Well, not on the floor, anyway. And uh, so uh, we were looking around for. But we, the other thing we knew that it just had to be a beautiful solution. 
So we looked around for a beautiful solution in involving hexagons, and we found one. Now, <laughs> but it, it had too many carbon atoms. <laughs> the other thing, let me say, in these days of political correctness, do not make the assumption that you know the sex of the person wearing these stockings. <laughs> I'll leave that for the question period. OK. Um, anyway, so there we are. That wasn't a good thing. So what the hell was going on? Well, when you're in this sort of situation, we were so excited. The obvious thing is to go out for a meal. And we went out for our, to our favorite Mexican restaurant and uh, the good company in Houston. Great chicken fajitas. I really enjoyed going there. And we were writing on serviettes and trying to solve this problem. And sitting at a particular table, which, let me just check. Well, I th it didn't matter. I think it was upside down. We were so excited we could have sat on it whether it was upside down or not. Anyway, sitting here and uh, discussing what the hell was going on. And as the discussion during the day on the Monday went, the consensus was that maybe, you know, if C60 was made out of this, the edges would be very unstable. So a pure carbon structure out of flat sheet of graphite Perhaps it could stabilize by the sheet curving round into a sphere. And that was the, the essential consensus that, uh, was a, that arose during that Monday. And that reminded me that in 1967, when I'd been a postdoc at, um, at Bell Labs, we'd gone up, my family, Mark, my, my, my older son, uh, had gone up to Montreal. And we'd seen this fantastic building, which is the Expo Pavilion that Buckminster Fuller had designed in Montreal. And this is from my favorite journal, which is Graphis. If you ever want a really good journal, Graphis is the journal of graphic art. And uh, the 1967, one of the 1967 issues was devoted to the expo. Thing. And this is a picture out of there. So this is the image. And I remembered that. And uh, Rick went off to get a book from the library on Buckminster Fuller. The second thing I remember was I'd made something for my children. And uh, I brought this with me. It's a star dome. And uh, I hope you can, I don't know whether you can, whether you can see this, but I'd made this for my children many years beforehand. And it's a map of the sky. And uh, during this, um, maybe it's up there, uh, you can see that uh, it's a very nice thing. And I made this, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll ring my wife up. Um, and uh, I thought about it, and then forgot about it, then went back. And then by that time, it was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't sure she'd be too pleased to get up try and find this wherever it was. But anyway, discussing it at the restaurant, um, I said, well, look, you know, this thing's not just got um, hexagons. In my memory, it's got pentagons as well. Anyway, uh, that night, Rick started cutting out carbon, uh, so, um, little sheets of hexagons. And uh, he went to the, to the freezer and got himself a Budweiser or something, you see. And then he remembered that, what about these pentagons? And with the hexagons alone, it doesn't, nothing happens. It stays flat. But when he put the pentagons in, it started to cup up into, into a ball. And believe it or not, the next morning, he came in with this fantastic model here. OK. There, it was a beautiful thing. It had 60 vertices. And at that point, we just knew this was it. it I remember thinking, it's too beautiful to be wrong. And anyway, if it was wrong, everybody would love it anyway. So, you know, it didn't really matter. And so that was it. We decided that was on a Tuesday, and we wrote the paper the next day because we thought, well, you know, this is such a n simple experiment now. We better move very fast. And uh, the question is, uh, well, what was it? Well, it was C60 molecule. It was a round cage. There it is. And then we had a discussion what to call it, and I suggested we call it after Buckminster Fuller and call it Buckminster Fullerene. And there was a discussion that it was a bit of a long name, and somebody said it's clumsy. And no, it's not clumsy. Buckminster Fullerene is not. Well, the English can say it. I don't know. You know but, but it's not. It's long. It's the best you can say. But, but you know, if you don't like it, you can always use, use the UPAC name. And uh, I guarantee <laughs> that is worse, OK? Um, anyway, uh, at this point, I think Rick then called a mathematician 
and taught, described this over the phone. And he said, we've got this molecule, which is this shape. You know, what, what is it? And uh, this, I must have admit, made me totally ashamed because this American mathematician rang back and said, it's a soccer ball. So <laughs> now, I don't know whether you can believe this because, you know, it's, you know, have you ever seen one of those situations where you look at something and then you, you're told that um, it's, um, it's something else, and when you look at it again, For the rest of my life, it always seems like a soccer ball. I don't know how it, I, I don't know how that happens, but it happened. You know. Anyway, let me tell you something about the secret of C60. It's very simple. Uh, we, it's so simple that, of course, we didn't know it. Okay. The first is that from Euler's law, you cannot close a cage with hexagons alone. It will never close up. It's a beautiful book on growth and form by Darcy Thompson. It's discussed in there and many other aspects. The second thing, if you're a chemist, you will know something else. And that is, if you have two pentagons side by side in a structure, that will be unstable. So, from Euler's law, you can show that you need 12 pentagons. If you've only got hexagons, it won't close. If you've got pentagons and hexagons, you must have 12. So, 5 times 12 is 60. And then add in the fact that the pentagons mustn't be together. You have a very nice explanation of why the C60 molecule is stable. It's as simple as that. It is the first cage that can close without the, the pentagons abutting side by side. Well, that was it. But how to prove it? These were the days of cold fusion. It wasn't just enough to have a beautiful, a beautiful uh, idea and suggest it. Um, I decided, I think we'd better be right okay, here. And if we weren't, I think that we had better prove it, okay? Because I didn't want, there were some people that I really didn't want to prove was wrong, okay? Well, let me go on because there's a beautiful technique and it's called nuclear magnetic resonance. And I understand that companies in this country are taking the word nuclear off their nuclear magnetic resonance. I suggest that those companies take the nuclei out of the people who put them, in, that who they put into their apparatus before them. It is a disaster. We're all made of nuclear, and just to, a euphemism to, is, is a disastrous thing that the, the world has got to realize that we're made of atoms. We're atomic, believe it or not. Now, nuclear magnetic resonance can tell you how many different types of carbon atom you have. And this molecule is C9, so it has, this one is the same as that, so that's one type. This is the same as that, so that's two. This has five different types of carbon atom. The one in the center is different from the others. So this will have five different resonances. C60 is a fantastic molecule. It has 60 atoms, but they're all the same. So the magnetic resonance spectrum will have only one peak. Fantastic. Now that's one up on the average organic chemist. I'm a chemical physicist. I'm going to take a 60 carbon atom molecule and prove its structure by only seeing one line. That's what I like. OK, so can we do it? This was the holy grail. Well, we tried something at Sussex. We didn't have any lasers. And uh, we set up a carbon arc. And in 1985, eight, just 86, we set this up. We took two carbon rods. And we vaporized material onto an electron microscope, microscope slide. And I made a fundamental error. I made the assumption that this simple thing would only produce maybe one part in a million C60. So I thought, well, Let's look at the, on the electron microscope image and see what we got. And we found that the carbon that was deposited changed in structure between 60 microns and 95 microns. So I thought, well, this, these are rounded objects which had formed round objects in the gas before they deposited. And then I thought, well, I'll use a quadrupole mass spectrometer to try to see whether C60 was being formed. And then I made a fundamental error. I didn't need a quadrupole. There was already about 1% to 10% of C60 in that picture. But I, the other unfortunate thing is I tried to get it from British companies, and they're not interested in research anymore. And so I failed and for about a year and a half, still trying to get this quadrupole. And then one day, a friend of mine, Mike Durer, 
who's an astronomer at UCLA, sent me a letter. And it's an incredible letter. And it's by Kretschmer, Fosteropoulos, and Huffman at Arizona, and Kretschmer, Fosteropoulos at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. And it says, Harry, presented at Capri, do you believe this? And here is the question mark on the poster, okay? Mike. And what did it say? The search for the UV and infrared spectra of C60 in laboratory produced carbon dust. It was a remarkable paper. What they had taken on board was that C60 would vibrate and would have only four infrared active modes. If you have a violin, it has four fundamentals. If you have a guitar, it has six. In the infrared, only four modes of the vibration of this molecule would be active. And they looked for them. And they showed this spectrum. And here were one, two, three, four vibration modes, very close to where theory suggested. It was impossible for me to believe it. There had to be one to five percent of C60 in there. I just felt it was impossible to, that this would be right. However, it was impossible, but I wanted to have a look at it. So what do you do? You give it to an undergraduate, all right? That's what you do. Because with an undergraduate, you don't want to give them experiments that will work. <laughs> you, you, because then they think research is easy, right? Uh, you've got to give them hard things. No, I'm being rather serious. In fact, with undergraduates, you can be much more speculative. So I, we have undergraduate projects in the third year. And uh, you can be speculative and do those really non-conservative experiments that you sometimes have a problem with the postdoc who needs to get a job and get on the tenure track. And this is the real problem with academia now. The pressures are so huge that many great scientists are really not doing the really speculative thing and taking risks. In the British system, you, you, you still, in some cases, can do that. And that's very, very important. So I put these two, an undergraduate and a graduate student. Again, on the left is Amit Sarkar, and on the right, Jonathan Hare. And here is just the bell job. We just wheeled it out. We'd already drilled the hole in for the argon. That had been done two years before. And let's repeat this stupid experiment by the stupid physicists. I mean, they couldn't be right, could they? It's impossible. This is chemistry. All right, they couldn't be right. OK, here's Jonathan adjusting. The electrodes here, and believe it or not, they were there. One, two, three. This is done on a sodium chloride plate. It can be done in the teaching labs with the, an infrared spectrometer. And this should become the quintessential example of the application of infrared to the detection of molecules. It's a wonderful story. This is a beautiful piece of science, absolutely wonderful, because they tracked it down. And they were interested in astrophysics as well. Well, this was unbelievable. But not only that, we sent it down to, for mass spectrometric study. Here we see. Came back from Scotland. This is Jonathan's wonderful book, OK? 26th to the 7th, from Scotland to find fab mass spectrometry. That'd be done with exciting results. Let's see what they are. A 720 mass signal. 720. That's 12 times 60. Could it really be there? Unbelievable. Then really important experiment. This is, I believe, to show you that you don't need high tech, the most important experiment ever done in my laboratory. We had discussed what C60 would it be, a gas, a liquid, or a solid. Jonathan took it all on board, and he believed it was C60. We used to call it C60B. This is before. On the, this is a Friday. He added 25 mils of benzene and allowed to stand for the weekend. What was there? red solution. Now this was incredible. He put a red solution. If, first, if you can just pass this here. I'll pass, I, I'd like it back. Uh, you know, this, is, this is a red solution. You'll never get it back, Eric. You will. You never know. <laughs> uh, now this is uh, fascinating. We started off with carbon. And carbon has diamond, which is here. And that's insoluble. And graphite, that makes pencil lead, that's insoluble. If you had a diamond ring and you started, and it dissolved away, you'd be pretty irritated, wouldn't you? If you and so would the person who bought it. I mean, you know. And in the notebook, just to show you, Jonathan written, the solution looks slightly reddish. This is on the Monday. On the Thursday, if we look on the, sorry, let me just, here. On the Thursday, 
evaporated down to about four or five drops and tried the fat mass spectrum, but didn't see C60. That turns out to be a very, very difficult experiment, but it was the right one. That was a Thursday. The next day, on the Friday, I got a call from Nature. Now, that's the journal. And uh, <laughs> they said, uh, the editor said, would you referee this new paper by Kretschmer and his colleagues, see whether it's any more than that previous paper? I said, well, sure, I'll do this. I know a bit about this. But I didn't know quite enough because this was Friday morning at 12 o'clock, a fax came through, and it was the worst day of my scientific career. It was C60, a new form of carbon, by Kretschmer, Lamb, Fosterophilus, and Huffman. It was a fantastic paper because as I read it through, there was a red solution. Ah, sitting with a red solution on my desk, and there were crystals, okay? And there was an X-ray structure. And the X-ray structure was absolutely sure that this was C60 crystals. And uh, I rang up. I said, you've got to publish this paper immediately. That was after. Well, I went for lunch first. I had two alternatives. I had to go for lunch or commit suicide. I decided to go for lunch um, and, and delay the suicide till later. Um, and uh, I rang up about 2 o'clock. I said, look, this, this is going to be faxed around the world. Uh, fantastic paper. And also congratulate Wolfgang Kretschmann, whom I knew. I knew from before because we worked in similar areas. He's a very close friend. And uh, then what to do? And you know in that film, North by Northwest, where Cary Grant is hanging on to Mount Rushmore by, the, by his fingernails, right? And the, the villain is stomping on his fingers to know. That's how I felt. As I read this paper through, however, there was one crack left. You can hold on. And it was the chemists. You see, they were physicists. The one thing they'd left for us, the, the real beautiful, elegant, Proof. It was there, it was no problem, was the NMR. And to a chemist, that was the, the beautiful final touch. They'd left us just that little thing to hang on, because we separated it, Jonathan had got it, we got the mass spectrum. Could we get to the NMR? Well, we were probably in a better position than anybody else, because we had the stuff. We had it already, because Jonathan had already made some. And my colleague, Roger Taylor, I met him at tea, he said, look, I'll help you. And he discovered something fascinating. When you take the red solution and chromatographically separate it, it separates into two solutions. Let me show you them on here. It turns out into a magenta and a red one. The red covers up, and here, let's send those around. There's loads of them. I hope you can see them. This wonderful magenta color up here. What was it? Was it, would it give our one line? So we sent it down to NMR, and Tony Avent, we got a, one of those outstanding NMR guys, Tony said, I've got, come down, I've got this fantastic single one line for you. And there it was, it's fantastic line. And he pointed to this, and he said, you know this line? He said, that's benzene. Now, <laughs> he said, um, Benzene's been done. <laughs> I've just been looking it up here. He said, Faraday extracted it in 1831. <laughs> so he said, even nature won't accept this, he said. He said, but look, he tell you something. If you look here, he said that. And I tell you, I can't even see it from here, but this thing here, this is where I finger that. He said, I reckon this is C60. And he was right. Because Roger went back, rechromatographed in that miserable little line, which we, could, we needed an electron microscope to see in the lab. I don't know what you could, you need a teles Mount Palomar telescope to see from out there. That was indeed C60. And it was fantastic because the magenta gave a single little line, and that was C60. But the red solution was C70. And C70 should have five different types of carbon atom. And that was great because. It was very similar to this molecule I just showed you now. The end ones are different from the ones in the middle. And in fact, it's ex almost exactly, except that there are five here and five there, five here, and so on. So C70 was the icing on the cake. There were not only, not just C60, but C70 as well. 
and that's how the field was born. Now then, there's an epilogue. Perhaps we should have known. Because in nature, you've got viruses which have this same pattern. Here is a pentagon on the corners, right? Has the same structure. This Orlonia in, in, uh, in, is, is, is to be found in Darcy Thompson's book on growth and form. Now, it's, it's got hexagons here. But you know it knows more than we chemists did because it's got to have some pentagon somewhere. And sure enough, you find the pentagons because it cannot close with hexagons alone. So it had already solved the problem. This guy solved the problem too. You see, if you try and do this and you, a fly gets into your apparatus, you end up with this guy here. And look, there you go. There's a pentagon in it. Nature, even in the eyes of insects, has solved this problem. My favorite, this is a tortoise, right? And we see the hexagonal plate here, right? Now, if it only had hexagons, the shell would be flat, right? And it'd be bloody drafty up the backside, I tell you. <laughs> no, it's put the pentagon into the back. OK, so let's go on, because Fra Luca Pacioli is a famous um, religious man who was fascinated by symmetry and wrote a book. And he decided he was a bit lazy. He decided he wanted someone to do his drawings for him. For him. Okay? He didn't do them himself. So he, he had a friend of his who was quite good at drawing, and it turned out to be Leonardo da Vinci. Okay? And what would you imagine? You've got a mate to do your drawings for your book, right? And it's Leonardo. I, I hope you can see a little bit. It's, it's Ucosahedron absiscus vacuus. It's hollow. It's the first image that we can find the way we can trace it to a hollow structure. That is C60. Another drawing by Piero della Francesca of the truncated icosahedron is to be found. Now, if you don't know all the work of Piero della Francesca, when you're in London, you go to the National Gallery and you'll see this fantastic painting. And what makes this painting exceptional, I think, is the symmetry of the dove over Christ's head. Okay, that C2V symmetry, which is the symmetry of all living animals. And even a devout atheist like myself uh, can appreciate the wonderful beauty and spirit of this painting. Just as I can of the, the, the thing that's made my couple of days, actually, is the, is the chapel here. This is one of the most wonderful buildings I've seen on my recent visit. So I had a, a great time architecturally as well as, as giving this talk. Well, what else? Let's go on to a few things. The first, we should go back to Buckminster Fuller's Dome. Because if you go to Montreal, go out to the expo site and try to find the Pentagon, right? There's one on here somewhere. And if you look, you see it there? That's the only one you can see on this picture. And it's triangulated. So you see a very interesting structure. It's a, a, it's a great piece of engineering. Because there's an outer skin, OK, which is this hexagon, which is triangulated, then an inner skin of, of hexagons incredible structure. And you could span the whole of Minnesota in the winter with one of these things, right? We have the technology to do that, and that might be a good idea, because it seems to me it's getting a bit cool in the last couple of days. Anyway, I wanted to make my own Buckminster Fuller's Dome, so I bought 300 quid's worth of molecular models. And, uh, and here's another interesting thing. Bought it just for fun. No, for no reason at all, just to have my own Buckminster Fuller's Dome. And believe it or not, somewhere under here, I brought this thing around. OK. There you go. And, but look, it's rather interesting. It's not round. It's got pentagons in the vertices. And I'll roll this out. Oops, Daisy. OK, right. It doesn't roll very well because it's not perfectly round. And it was interesting because it turned out that just making that model explained the structures of carbon, round carbon particles, that they would have these icosahedral patterns. So a piece of just fun turned out to explain something that had not been understood for 20 years. Shows another aspect. Well, I should show you this, because this is another Buckminster Fuller dome. But not only that, sticking out here is what we call a nanotube. You, anybody heard of the nanotubes? These are amazing things. These will probably be the first applications of fullerene-related materials. Now, I used to call these Zeppelines, all right? My students have a slightly ruder name for it, actually. <laughs> I'm going to hand this round, too, so you can have. 
I need him back, actually, but, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, and these are, the ends have the pentagons on, and they're just round graphite structures. They're about 100 times smaller than standard carbon fibers. And these are almost certainly the strongest materials that have ever been made. And if these can be put into composites, they'd be wonderfully strong materials. And that, I think, is the future uh, area of nanotechnology. Well, I got another guy. There's some chemistry. Paul Burkett, working with Dave Walton and Roger Taylor and myself, has managed to put phenyl groups. This is one, like one of those little fossil creatures from the old days, right? And it walks around. And it's fascinating. I'll send this round because we now know where the phenyl groups go. You see, it's got five phenyls, it's got five legs, and it's got this hydrogen atom. So far, we've only succeeded in making the male of the species, but uh, <laughs> send that around. <laughs> Okay, so, well, let's, let's finish because there's not the football teams. Let me show you the key, key ones here. On the right is Jim Heath. People have asked, can you put an atom on the inside? Jim Heath worked out how to do that. He made lanthanum C60. He put the first atom on the inside. On the left is Sean O'Brien. He worked out under what conditions was C60 stable what was going on there. In the middle is Bob Curl. He's really the captain of the team. That's why he's holding the ball. And it was Bob to whom I first suggested this, and it was Bob who was keen to do this. And it was Bob who convinced Rick that this experiment was worth doing. And of course, Rick was the guy who really made it possible by developing this cluster beam technique, which, as I say, has revolutionized cluster science. And clusters are important. Because what is bringing the physics community and the chemistry community together is that the physicists are getting to smaller and smaller units. And the chemists are making bigger and bigger molecules. And we're getting together for the first time in 100 years and realizing physicists are not that bad after all. Okay, They're not that good either, but they're still uh, no, they're getting better. OK, so that's, that, was, that was good. This, the second, there's another football team that I'd like you to see, and it's the Sussex team. And it's Abdul Sadar who worked really hard to get that mass spectrum. Our mass spectrometer was really breaking down, and we just managed to get it. It was really bad news for us, actually, because it delayed us several weeks. On the right, Jonathan, who, as I say, fantastic student, really one of, wonderful with kids. And he has developed uh, lots of uh, projects with schools. That, there are schools now in the area who are making C60, and the kids are just loving it, and it's done wonderful things for uh, chemistry because it's beautiful and also something that they can actually do. Roger in the middle, well, he's looking happy because he's the first guy to see that beautiful magenta solution. And on the right, David Walton, who really got me interested in these carbon molecules in the first place. But there's another football team, and it's this one. And, uh, you know, the really bad thing about this, I'm sure that this is there in... in um, because they don't, you didn't want to show you that I once had hair, all right? I'm, that, this is my hair, right? I used to be, this used to be black, you know, believe it or not. Uh, Lorne Avery, one of the astronomers, he never had hair, any hair at all, actually, as you see here. Takeshi Oka in Chicago, the guy who got the spectrum of H3+, fantastic piece of work. John McLeod, Lorne Avery, and Norm Broughton were the astronomers who really knew where to point the telescope in, in, this, in the project that discovered the carbon chains. Well, I can't finish this without pointing out we got into the newspaper. They got the wrong photograph, unfortunately, here. Uh, and it got here on the right-hand side as organic find will add to the origin of life controversy. I won't go through this, but this is the, you're on the, a scientist on the front of the times, and we're discussing the origin of life. You know, it's should you laugh or should you cry? It's really difficult to know what to say. And then it got into the local newspaper, the Brighton Evening Argus. Okay. And it was, life's key may lie among the stars. And a student wrote, that's showbiz underneath here, right? <laughs> he took an extra year to get his degree for writing that, OK? <laughs> uh, let me go on, because uh, uh, Sussex University boffins could make scientists change their minds about how life began. Their theory is that the very first forms of life could have been created in outer space. I'm reading that and realizing the people next door know me, and they're reading this, okay? And I try to tell them I'm doing some reasonable stuff, so they think I'm working on this area. 
Uh, you know, there's a, another part of unbelievable. They have discovered proof that there are organic chemicals in some of the vast dust clouds between the stars. Only one simple step would be needed to change these chemicals into the building blocks of life. The chemicals were discovered thanks to Canadian work in radio astrology. But, believe it or not, someone thought about it. The first one is David Jones in 1966 thought of hollow molecules, and he says there is a curious discontinuity between the density of gases and that of liquids and solids. Daedalus has been contemplating ways of bridging this gap and has conceived the hollow molecule. This would be a closed spherical shell of a sheet polymer like graphite, whose basic molecule is a flat sheet of carbon atoms bonded hexagonally rather like chicken wire. He proposes to modify the high temperature synthesis of graphite by introducing suitable ill-fitting foreign atoms. His idea was quite correct. He wanted to induce the pentagons. And that's the way C60 is made, believe it or not. And what's more, something I'm sure you can all read is shown on the next slide, because here we see C C the, the soccer ball, and down here, I hope you can see it here, it says C60, because A.G. Osawa, brilliant Japanese scientist, thought of C60 and said, if you could make this, it would be stable. Well, and one other slide, and I've got uh, another, um, just a few more left. I thought, I've taken you on a random walk, and I changed here Leonardo's man to show you a random walk through science, art, and design to, to show you that, uh, you know, Leonardo was pretty close. If only he'd put this one round it, we'd have been fine. I'm just gonna, I've got one other thing. I'd just like to change the carousel. Is that possible? Yeah. Um, let me just see this, because I probably have to read this out, because I'd like to share something with you which uh, came up, and uh, um, it's quite remarkable. Yeah, it was, we have a, a verbatim account of what goes on in the House of Lords, and it's called Hansard. And Hansard, um, on the 10th of December, Lord Errol of Hale asked Her Majesty's government what steps they are taking to encourage the use of Buckminster Fullerene in, in science and industry. And there was a discussion and uh, it actually makes more sense this way than it does the, the right way up, so leave, leave, it, leave it that way. Um, anyway, after this discussion, um, uh, there was a, a yeah, let, what, well, I think it was, let's see this. Yeah, Lord Williams of Elville. Um, he said, uh, is the Lobel Lord aware in supplementing his answer that the football-shaped carbon molecule is known for some extraordinary reason as buckyball. These are the sort of questions that go on. Lord Williams, well, you know, I don't know whether you've read Tolkien, but you know, he never made those names up. You know, he, he just got them. <laughs> there are actually people in England who who are they? I mean, he just has to go to the House of Lords, and you just have to take a film, and you, you don't have to make a film of uh, the Lord of the Rings. You just take the House of the Lords. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, oh yeah, uh, the next one was unbelievable. Baroness here, my lords, forgive my ignorance, but can the noble lord say whether this thing is animal, vegetable, or mineral? Uh, oh. Is it the shape of a rugger football or a soccer football? Well, it turns out there was a photographer present at the time. Uh, um, I think this, um, Helmut Schwarz in Berlin sent me this photograph, and I think it's the most wonderful, one of the most wonderful pictures I've ever seen. I, I feel so much empathy with this animal uh, that I'd rather be, be in his cage than in the House of Lords. I mean, they, they, anyway, uh, at the end of the day, you, you have to give them credit because ultimately the House of Lords are going to come up with the $64,000 question, and it's here from Lord Campbell of Alloway. My lords, what does it do? All right. Lord Ray, my lords, it is thought that it may have several possible uses for batteries as a lubricant or as a semiconductor. All that is speculation. It may turn out to have no uses at all. <laughs> but of course, there are some smart guys and there are people who know their, their literature because um, Bertrand Russell's youngest son is in there too, and he got the last line. He says, my lords, can one say that it does nothing in particular and does it very well? 
Thank you very much. Yes, sure. And, uh, it, it, you're going to be swamped with questions afterwards. Yes, I mean, a third. No, no. <laughs> no, I, I'll take it, yeah. I'll hide. <laughs> We'd like to have a, a brief uh, panel discussion here. Uh, try to keep it to about 10 minutes. Uh, coffee will be served uh, outside, I believe, unless it's raining. Uh, somebody should let me know. It's dry, uh, Chaplin says. So coffee and cookies will be served out on Ekman Mall shortly. Uh, let me begin by uh, seeing if someone has a question or comment. Uh, Harry, I can start. Uh, <laughs> Uh, first of all, wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, can you say a little bit about the reactivity of C60? Is it, uh, in terms of organic chemistry, is it simple to describe? Uh, is it simple as just a, a double bond type reactivity, or is it more, in other words, is it more like ethylene or more like benzene? Trust Harry to ask the question which has a 10 minute answer. <laughs> um, when it's, it's interesting that Osawer said it would be super aromatic and uh, there's been a lot of controversy about whether C60 is an aromatic compound or not. Now for those who you, I hope uh, know a little bit about aromaticity, benzene has a structure where it, the, the double bonds flip from one to the other and it turns out that C60 reacts as though the bonds are localized so that they're localized outside the pentagons. Okay, that's the way it reacts. And it's turning out that if you talk about aromaticity, other people say, well, it's not that, it's ring currents. It's the way in which the electrons circulate in, the, in, the, in it. And it, they do circulate. And they, the, the carbon atoms do appear to have aromatic character if ring currents are what you're talking about. But the reactivity, um, is more um, like a, um, a polyene, okay? It, it reacts as though it's a double-bonded compound. So even though it has a spectrum, it absorbs light in a visible region, yes. indicating, you know, there are, uh, it's more, in fact, it's 
red shifted from benzene. Yes. But it, it reacts more like uh, UV absorbing. Yes, well, the, the problem is you can't really substitute it, right? Because it's not, you have to substitute the carbons. And so it, it changes your picture of what aromaticity is. I, I think, it, my view is that we, it, it is an aromatic compound. It's like wave particle duality. If, if you look at it and ask, you know, some questions, it will be, be aromatic. If you ask other questions, it will be a non-aromatic compound. And we're starting to learn where the groups go, and they add to the surface. And the, the molecule I sent around with five phenyl groups is a beautiful result that Paul Burke, a postdoc working with us, has just got. And he's showing exactly how that molecule will add groups. And it's very difficult work, but it does pay off in the end. It's a molecule that really deserves to be kicked around a lot, OK? And when you do that, in the end, it gives in and tells you its secrets. And the secrets are fascinating because it's a bit, they're different from other, other molecules. You can imagine me for a second being a high school student, wide-eyed after your talk. And I come up to you and I say, Professor Croto, should I work on C60 now? And if so, what should I do? Or should I go explore some other area? What would you say? I, I mean, I think C60 is the, the molecule of the 21st century, obviously, and it, but it's going to take till that time to find out what, what is happening. I think it's going to be an interesting molecule for uh, a platform for um, putting things on the outside. And so if one wants to think about um, biological molecules, you can, you can put 60 groups on there. And the question that uh, Philip Anderson asked this mo morning, you know, why do you have to be so specific? If you want to uh, make, say, uh, an HIV virus inhibitor, which C60 has, it has now more positions in which to position accurately molecules, so right, it sits right. in particular cavities. So it, it's the molecule which will be the complement of the molecules that you're making. Mm -hmm. You're making the, the cavities, mm -hmm. but biology has made some cavities that we want to uh, put something in, and this molecule has some possibilities of, of being more flexible than other molecules that are around. So I think it has tremendous possibilities. Has that work on the HIV uh, protease inhibition gone anywhere, or was that just a one-shot Not to my deal? knowledge. I mean, I know that they're trying to make some other ones. Um, my view is, however, I think that you should be interested in this molecule, as I know you, I'm sure you yeah. are. And the reason is that it's got fascinating electrical pro electronic properties. For instance, something that should interest you is that the ionization of is, has a very long-lived ionization. It can store energy maybe 100 times longer than other molecules. So that if, you, if you irradiate it with photons, it takes a long time for the electron to pop off. And so those are the sorts of thing, things that might interest someone who is trying to slow down the electron transfer properties. It's, uh, it, it does things other molecules don't do. And it it's already been linked to some donors and acceptors uh, for charge separation. Absolutely, there has yes. been work done in that area already that's yeah. very interesting. Can I make a comment? Um, at the risk of appearing like an, I have only one, one subject of interest, I think it's almost as miraculous, I do think, that the molecule is miraculous, but it's almost as miraculous the discovery of Art, Art Hebert that if you add exactly three electrons to the molecule and the appropriate amount of sodium or potassium or cesium, you, it's a metal. It's not a metal if you add three minus epsilon or three plus epsilon, but just exactly three. And no one, no one whatsoever that I know of knows why. It's amazing. It's a metal, and it's a superconducting metal with a very high transition temperature. Yep. I think the... Still to add to that and to add to Harry's question, if you can put, say, a lanthanum on the inside of C60, you could then add the three electrons by internally, and that opens up huge possibilities for, you know, just may be the room temperature system. You know, you just, I mean, probably not, but nevertheless, the, the holy grail in this area, and the, the area if a young scientist comes up and says, what should we do? We should try to put an atom on the inside, and for every you know, there's a whole periodic table to put it on the inside. And not only that, when the atom goes on the inside, it stabilizes different types of fullerene. So C82, you can't easily get. But you put lanthanum on the 
inside, and it stabilizes the C82. So there's a you know, there's a whole peri new periodic table of every element of the period you can put a cage around. Not only that, you can put lots of cages around it. How big is the hole in the middle, huh? It's big enough for most al uh, lanthanum. I mean, it's probably... You could put any yellow. You could seven, put any... Atom. About five, four, to four angstroms across, free of electrons. If you, if and you, you knew that hollow, you knew the hole was there from the models or from any simple considerations. You knew that from the beginning. Yes, because the... the you knew it wouldn't sort of collapse. Yeah, because be you know that the carbon to carbon distance is seven, is seven angstroms. And the graphite, the pi electron is, is one and a half. So mm -hmm. three, you've got seven angstroms minus three. So it's a four angstrom gap in the center. All we need is a microgram or so. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, well, we're trying. Uh, it's Good. very, very Good. hard. But I mean, this wonderful piece of work now in Santa Barbara, Fred Woodle's group have got nitrogen into the so C59 nitrogen, which is the the C60 analog of pyridine. The heterocyclic chemistry is starting up, and, and they've also opened a hole in the cage, and we have too. Paul Burke, this group work has just found a hole in C70 opened up, so now we can probably put something in and then close it up again. It's really very exciting, but it's hard. But, you know, the youngsters of today, they're, they're going to beat us easily into the ground. I mean, they're not going to have these petty rivalries between chemists and physicists. They're going to be the chemical physicists of, of the future, and they're going to solve problems that we find hard. You're a and dream on, dream on, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> those lines, let me share something that I, I just observed when that large ball was being passed around. Uh, one of the undergraduates that I know noticed that a carbon-carbon bond had broken and said to me, you suppose that's where a substitution reaction could occur? <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's the kind of question that they're apt to ask. Isn't yeah, it? and it can, be, it can now be done because right. we, the most recent one is this nitrogen one, which I think is an absolutely beautiful piece of work because that now puts another electron into the system. And, you know, if you put three nitrogens, you put three into more electrons. And that looks like an interesting thing to do. Are people working with uh, substituting uh, uh, other materials like uh, silicon and germanium? Yes. Uh, the, the problem with silicon, I, I don't think you'll ever see a silicon 60. And I'll, I know from bitter experience that whenever I say you'll never do this, that someone turns up and does it. You know, I'm mean, sure almost any scientist, as they get older, they, they become more cocky about what they can predict and as they get even older they realize that they're even more stupid but <laughs> silicon silicon 60 is pretty difficult anyone who d i really would take my hat off because silicon really doesn't like to make a double bond very much it's very difficult and the only reason we've got c60 is that carbon really loves double bonds and it really likes to make and that's why we're here and if silicon liked it as much as carbon we'd be made out of silicon Marines really would be tough then. <laughs> but what, what? I know. Silicon but if you look at the, what if you do the same cluster experiments with silicon? What do you see now? Um, you see you lots. Probably of have the data right now, so oh, you're yeah, very confident. Yes. Oh yeah, that's been done. I mean, Rick, Rick Stone did yeah. that. I mean, you, don't have, you don't have any peaks up in that region. Yeah, but the, we don't know what the structures are. Lots of peaks, and maybe silicon 45. Some types of diamond structure. But the problem with diamond, and one of the major things, which I'm slightly surprised hasn't been discussed, is what's called reconstruction uh, as, as uh, materials get smaller and smaller sizes. I mean, the, the reason why the physicists day and the, it is over in the major region, why they have to come to talk to chemists, is that if you want to miniaturize silicon in the semiconductors and get to smaller and smaller units, you, you, you hit a point where the silicon will start to form a cluster of a given structure and lose its, its semiconducting capability. But the chemists know how to, how to make molecules with, with the size of 10 angstroms or some, and will learn, and if they come together to try and work out what those molecular storage units will be, that will, will, will be the molecular uh, electronics of the future. And so what we're, we're, I, I think it's very exciting, very exciting time, and I think C60 will play a part in that. I think the, the young scientists, I think, should be solving the high, I mean, the real problem is the one that Harry mentioned this, this is what we're all thinking about. And I think if you just put C60 into your system, you solve it. can make it work. Yeah, it'll make it work, yeah. I think yeah. so. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll reconvene in about 20 minutes after the hour for music, and then Professor Schwaber's paper at 3.30.